Now, what sparks my interest in this is that I was trying to think what is the very first computer, or what was the very first computer that I ever consciously came into contact with. And I think it was this, the Research Machines 380Z uh, computer system. And I'm pretty certain that when I went, when I was probably about 10 years old, and I went up to my high school for a sort of an open day or open evening or something, to see what the high school was like before I started it, um, I'm pretty certain I played some kind of game like Battleships or something on a computer. I remember it had a green screen and I think it was a Research Machines 380Z because then a couple of years later, well, later when I joined the school and joined the computer club at the school, we got to play on this um, Research Machines 380Z that they had. And I remember thinking it looked strangely old-fashioned even then, and it really does. I mean, look at this thing. It's got a keyboard that's made... I remember that keyboard. It weighed half a tonne, that keyboard. It was made out of iron. It had a green screen, and it had this box with these two big handles on the front and a key on it. It was actually a computer that you started up with a key, which is quite amazing. And if you look at the thing, um, the price here... For a 32K system, it's £1,787 with a single floppy disk. And for the 16K system, with keyboard. <laughs> so what does that mean? Does that mean no floppy drives? No, it can't be. Anyway, that was 965 Now you could buy, in 1979, you could buy a really nice car, really nice car for about £4,000. So we're talking a lot of money um, to buy one of these computers. And Research Machines, it was a UK, British company, it looked like they're based in Oxford. Um, they targeted the education market and they sold a lot of computers into schools. In fact, they mentioned it in the article, what about schools and colleges? Um, and uh, it meant that a lot of UK schools had a Research Machines 380Z in there. We had two of them. It had two floppy disk drives, five and a quarter inch. You can see the pictures of them here, five and a quarter inch floppy disk drives. Um, that box-shaped green monitor screen, the very heavy, key heavy keyboard, and you could press that reset button on the front of it and you could drop out to a sort of, um, you could reset the Z80 back to a, a kind of a monitor. And then you typed J103 to jump to memory location 103. And I was kind of hoping that building this Z80-based um, CPM machine my answer, the mysterious question of why did you type J103 to get back into your program when you just press the reset button? Maybe I'll find out. Okay, so let's make a start here then. So what I want to do is I want to um, put onto... I'm going to do this on solderless breadboard, even though I don't really like solderless breadboard because I've wasted hundreds of hours trying to solve problems with circuits that... Um, but the problem was that I had a bad connection on my solderless breadboard. But um, I'm just going to go with it anyway, because I'm still sort of prototyping this thing. And then hopefully, once it's working, I can transfer it to something else, like something more permanent, like a strip board or uh, a proper um, PCB that I get manufactured. Oh, that's not good, is it? Um, the pins don't fit in, so I'm just bending them a little bit. I have uh, just touched the radiator because this is static sensitive. I probably should have done that first. There we go. So we've got the Z80 in there. Ooh, see, that's a bad fit. Um, so the little notch on the Z80 is at that end. And I just find it easier if I keep everything lined up from left to right. And I've got one of these breadboards with the two rails at the top, two rails at the bottom negative and positive, and um, I'll connect up the Z80 power to those and the address lines and the data lines across the next chip, which is going to be the memory. So on this, I'm thinking it's going to take at least three uh, breadboards. So I'm going to have the CPU and the memory on this one. I'll have the peripherals, so the Arduino and the... Um, SD card on the other one and then I'll use another one for things like power supply and clock and that sort of thing because uh, I think I was a bit weak on clock signals in my last uh, attempt at this so I want to do it properly this time 
Uh, let's have a look then. So this one is the memory. It's a spectacularly long, thin chip, isn't it? If we just bend that down, they always, I don't know how they do it, but they always build them, always manufacture them with the pins too wide to go into solderless breadboard. I don't know if that's a deliberate strategy. Um, in fact, to be honest, I don't even know why they manufacture things that are in dip format at all anymore because everybody just uses surface mount stuff, don't they? But um, So as I've said, all, everything I've got here I get off of eBay for about a pound or less a time. I don't spend a whole lot of money on these things and I always buy more than one. I always buy like a pack of five or something like that because usually a pack of five doesn't cost much more than a single one. Why am I having so much trouble getting this into here? Um, and I'm very good at blowing up my uh, components by putting them in the wrong way around and shorting things out. So I've, I always feel it's nice and safe. If I've got five of them, I blow one of them up, uh, I take it out, throw it in the bin, stick another one in, and I haven't lost any time. So I've come to the conclusion that buying five instead of buying one actually saves me time and effort and money in the long term. Or at least hassle. Here's one of my EPROMs. Now, these are a bit funny, these EPROMs, because they are a little bit too clever for their own good. They're electrically erasable, and you can set in them a lock code so that you can't erase them, and it's all done in software. You send in a special string of digits to it, which it understands and goes into lock mode. So I bought about, I don't know, I've got about 20 of these things, which I bought from China, and they've already been used, and they've got programs in them already, or data, I think it is, not really programs. And some of them were already locked, so I couldn't um, use them. And I'd spent ages trying to work out how to unlock them. And I managed to unlock some and not others. So the ones that I've got working, and I've definitely tried out, I've stuck a big sticker on so I can't get them mixed up with anything else. So let's put that on there. I don't know why I've done it quite that way, but there we go. We've got a little space at the end there. We could put, hmm, I could possibly fit my glue logic in there. Let me just think about that. Yes, I think I will. I'll put my glue logic in. So this is, actually, this isn't what I'm going to use for my glue logic at all. It's just a placeholder chip. I'll just put it there to make sure that things fit in. And that's actually quite nice, isn't it? So you need some kind of logic to map the um, EEPROM and RAM into the Z80's address space all in one uh, sort of easy way. Um... But it's more, it's slightly complicated because the Z80 has got a 64K address, well, it's got a 16-bit address bus, so it means that the Z80 can only talk to 64K of RAM, and I want to have 64K of RAM and some ROM as well, so I have to do a little bit of clever uh, trickery to get that thing done, which I'll go into in a bit. So if I can get up uh, the Z80... Um, well, I thought this was the data sheet. It's actually the user manual, which is slightly different to the data sheet, uh, but it will do. Uh, we'll just zoom that in a little bit. So the important thing here, first of all, where you should always start is by reading the data sheet with any of these kind of components. And what you want to see really is obviously where the pins go in. And um, it says here that the address bus is a uh, 16-bit address bus uh for up to 64k and for io device exchanges and that's absolutely true the um this is a useless data sheet right i've managed to get a decent um data sheet here with the pinout on it so yeah, they're, they're quite difficult, these pins on the Z80. For some reason, they haven't put, for example, ground, you'd expect it to be down the bottom corner. Five volts, you might think, would be at the top right corner. The, da the data bus is numbered all funny. It's a little bit of a bad pinout, but we're just going to have to put up with it. So it's a five volt device, um, and it has a clock coming in on pin six. It's got 16 address lines. It's got eight data lines. And then it's got a bunch of other lines which are to do with sort of controlling how the whole thing works. So you can think of it as an 8-bit uh, eight bit data bus, 16-bit, an 8-bit data bus, a 16-bit address bus, and a sort of, I don't know, what's that, about 10 or 12 control bus lines. So the ones that are of interest to us is pretty 
pretty much all of them. Now there's one to do with interrupts, I'm not gonna be doing, in fact there's two to do with interrupts, I'm not gonna be bothering with those. There's a halt pin, which tells us when the CPU is halted. Not too interested in that, but we do need the memory request, uh, which is used whenever the CPU wants to access memory. The I.O. request for whenever it wants to access peripherals, the read and write pins, and I'm going to be probably quite interested in the reset and the wait pin. There's a couple of other ones that we're not, I, I, I don't think I'd ever use the refresh one, and the M1 isn't too interesting either. So I'm going to be using a few of those control pins, uh, but pretty much everything on the chip there. Now, what you've got to do, well, what, let's just say, what does a Z80 processor do? Well, it's going to um, it's going to run a set of instructions. And when you switch a Z80 on, it starts looking in memory at location 0. So it's going to look in this RAM chip here for location 0. It's going to find the first instruction in there, and it's going to obey that instruction. Then it'll probably go on to instruction in the next memory location, or it might jump to an instruction in a different memory location. But it's basically going to start at address zero and work its way through the memory. So it needs to be able to talk to the RAM chip via the address lines to tell the chip which address, which memory location it wants to read data from. And then it gets the data through the data bus back to the Z80, uh, works out what the instruction is and decides on what to do with it. So I need to connect up all the data lines on the Z80, on the memory chip, on my EEPROM, on my Arduino, I need to connect all of those together. So the D0 on each of those chips needs to be connected to the D0 on each of the other chips. D1 needs to be all connected together, D2 all connected together. So it's going to be eight, line, eight wires from there to there, eight wires from there to there, eight wires from there to the Arduino, um, and that's just for the data. Then I need to connect the address lines together. So I've got to connect 16 lines from here to here, 16 from here to here, but I don't need the address to go to the Arduino because um, I'm using it as a peripheral. It doesn't need to actually worry about memory addresses. So there's going to be quite a lot of wires and I want to keep them neatly. So I'm going to have to plan this out so that it works out nicely and I don't get that rat's nest effect, which I got in the prototype. 